Welcome to the first in our tutorials on working with GIMP, the new image manipulation program. This program is a free program that allows you to do similar things to Photoshop as well as other image editors. Opening the program, we can see that GIMP usually opens with a multi-window mode, the main image window, the toolbox, and the layers box. Similar to Photoshop, GIMP can also work with layers. In case you accidentally close any windows, you can click Window, Recently Closed Docs, and reopen them. If you like the Single Window Mode, which is similar to Photoshop, click Window, then click Single Window Mode. Many of the different windows and dialog menus that you'll use will come from the Windows drop-down at the top. For example, if we need to use layers often, which will very much be the case, we go to Windows drop-down, Dockable Dialogs, and we can see the entire list of tools we can use for our setup. Making sure our Layers window is open to the right, we can add many other options to our creation suite, such as Histogram, Gradients, Colors, and more. Options like these are similar to Photoshop, so you can have a basic translation of knowledge between the programs here. Once you have your setup the way you want it, we can continue on to the next tutorial. From here, I'll be working with GIMP as a single window setup so that it makes it easier for tutorials and showing where options are in future tutorials. In our second tutorial for GIMP, we'll go over how to open images, save them into different formats, as well as exporting images depending on what you need for various projects. Similar to Photoshop, we'll show you how you can open an image in GIMP. Just click the File drop-down, click on New, and the New Image window will pop up. From here, you can set a template for your files, which might include a size a client for your job wants or your project needs, change the image size, width, and height on your own, and change if it's in Portrait or Landscape. Advanced options will let you do similar things to Photoshop, which is change resolution, color, and what you fill the background with before you start working. To open a file, just go to File, click Open, and search for any file you'd like to open. I'll open the file that we've been using in our Photoshop tutorials. Note that GIMP can open Photoshop files as well as PNG, JPEG, and PDF files. It's a very versatile program. You can also open a file into your current image as layers, so you can essentially import an image onto another one. Just like Photoshop, you can save the file as its own type, which is XCF, or you can export it through the File dropdown, then click Export as option. Here you can click the drop-down and save it as any myriad of options, including PNG, JPEG, and PDF. That's it for the basics of creating, saving, and exporting in GIMP. The third in our tutorial series for GIMP will introduce you to the basics of resizing images as well as cropping, rotating, and flipping images. These features are very similar to Photoshop, but how you do them in GIMP may differ. Start by having your document loaded into GIMP. You can see we have our image ready for moving it around. Once you want to resize your image, go to the Image drop-down, then to Scale Image. This is what resizing an image is called in GIMP. Once there, you can see the dialog box. The dialog box here for Scale Image lets you choose the width, height, and resolution of the image as you see fit. You can also change the quality of the image here as well. The Scale tool on the left here can also allow you to resize the image like a selection tool would in Photoshop. Just click the image and resize accordingly. Cropping an image also works similarly as you've seen it in Photoshop as well. Click on the Crop tool, the little knife icon, and you'll be allowed to make a selection over the image which will tell the tool where and what you want to crop. Click on the image again after selection to crop the image. Rotating the image, of course, works in a very simple way. The Rotate tool is next to the Crop tool, just to the right. Once you click on it, you can see the tool options below the tool, where you can do it by layer, or a selection similar to Crop. 
or a much more advanced way through a path. We'll just use the layer rotate. Click on the layer you want to rotate in the image, and you can use a slider to rotate left or right, or set the angle yourself. To flip an image, click on the tool that looks like a book opening here on the toolbar. Set the preferred way to flip the image, horizontal or vertical, on the tool options and just click on the image. Easy! With this, you can move and rotate, flip and resize the image just the way you want to. In this fifth tutorial, I'll talk about how to use the selection tools in GIMP. Selection tools are the best way to get the parts of the image you need for cropping, cutting, and more. Once again, we have our image ready in GIMP, so we can use a myriad of selection tools on it. There are at least seven selection tools in GIMP. We'll go over each one in basic detail. Each one has tool options, the panel below the tool on the left that you can tweak the settings for. First is your usual rectangular selection. Just like our Photoshop tutorial, just click and drag what you want to select here. Similarly, the oval selection tool next to it can be used to select things in a circular or oval pattern. Next we have the free select or lasso tool where you can draw your own selection around an object so you can freehand trace a selection you need to. After that we have the fuzzy select tool which, much like the magic wand in Photoshop, will select a region based on the colors around it. This one can take longer than usual to select something. You can tweak the settings in the Tool Options box to change the threshold that the wand will select what you want from the image. Threshold means it will select more or less things based on the higher or lower the threshold. Then we have the Select by Color tool, which will select things on the image based on the color you have in the foreground color box, which is seen below the tool window. Then you have the Scissors Select tool, which will attempt to select things based on detecting edges on the image. As you start clicking around the edge of the thing that you want to select, it will guess where it thinks the edges of the image are. And you can guide the points of the selection so that the program can figure out where the edges of the thing you're selecting is. This is by far one of the most intelligent tools you can use in GIMP. Lastly, we have the Foreground Select tool, which you'll start with a lasso around the thing you want to select. Once you've selected part of the image, it will create a blue mask over the image. Then you'll be able to mark what you want the selection to pick up out of the image. It'll be the best tool to select things that are in the foreground as opposed to the background. It's really great for photos. That's most of the selection tools covered in GIMP. Now you can grab exactly what you need out of the images you're using. In our sixth tutorial on GIMP, let's start using the paint tools and learn the tool options the paint tools use. There's a lot to go over here, so I'll be breaking this up into two parts. The first of the paint tools tutorial begins here. With our image open, Let's start creating something by using some paint tools. First, we'll use the paint brush. Make sure to check the tool options on all of these, as they will be very useful for doing what you need with each one. In the tool options here, you can see that there's a mode setting, opacity to your brush, what the brush looks like, how hard it is, think like an actual brush on an image, how soft or hard do you want the tip to press on the painting, the size of the brush, angle, and more. For now, we'll just leave it as is and create a quick square. Next, we'll move on to the Bucket Fill tool. Here we can see that in the Tool options, we have the option to change the opacity, change it so that we fill up the spot with the tool with the foreground or background color, or even a pattern if we want to. The options below that allow us to either fill the whole selection as much as possible, or just similar colors if we want more reserved filling. Threshold here will determine how much the tool will try to overflow into the nearby colors beyond what you have filled in. Here we'll fill in our square with our background color. As you can see, with the similar colors option, it will fill in everything except the transparent edges around our square border, leaving a little bit unfilled. Patterns can be applied to from the bucket. 
So let's apply a quick pine wood pattern here to give the box a little wooden feel to it. Here you can see it will paint over our white fill with a nice wooden texture. Our box is starting to look like an actual wooden box. Next, we'll do a gradient or blend fill. So we'll apply a gradual color change from our foreground to our background color. This works very similar to bucket fill, just that you can choose the colors you want to fill in either as a foreground to background selection or to a preset selection of your choice. The shape can be changed as well to create more impressive gradients. Here I'll make a radial gradient inside our box fill. Make sure you select what you want to gradient as well, otherwise you'll add the gradient to your entire layer. Click and drag to determine what direction you want the gradient to go. The ink tool is similar to the paintbrush, but it creates an ink-like pool of color that works similar to real ink. The longer you stay on a spot, the more comes out and the strokes ebb and flow, much like real ink. Change the options as you need in the tool options window. We'll draw a little smiley face on our box. The airbrush tool is very similar to an actual airbrush where a constant flow comes out that allows you to quickly touch up or brush color onto the image in a way that can be modified. As you see in the tool options, one of the important settings is rate and the other is flow. Tweaking these will change the way the airbrush comes out. Watch as I set the flow to about 20. And see what happens. Now, 30. You can now see that the lines are much thicker than they were before. This gives you granular control over how you want your airbrush to look. Lastly, we have the pencil and eraser tools. Much like an actual pencil, you can draw a very fixed, quick line with this tool and is the simplest tool in the bunch. I'll give our smiley face some eyebrows. From there, the eraser can pretty much remove everything from the image. So like other tools, you can change the size of the eraser, the hardness, and many other features. Be warned that the eraser removes all the data from the image, so you will have to recolor in a spot you erased or fill holes you might create yourself. Oops. I seem to have erased the eyebrows. This completes our first part in the tutorial about the paint tools in GIMP. Now you know a lot about how to paint up your own images. Welcome to our advanced GIMP tutorial where we'll actually show you a way how to do digital black and white conversion. It's quite an easy effect to do. We'll start by opening up an image that you might have seen before on a previous tutorial. We'll open that up and we'll show you how we'll be able to do the conversion here. Now you can do a saturate effect in GIMP as well, but what I like to do is create a new layer. So we'll go over here and we'll go ahead and make a new layer. Uh, we'll make that transparent, that's fine. And from there, we'll also create a layer mask. So go ahead and add a layer mask to this layer. Make sure that it's set to white so it's full opacity. And you wanna change this layer's mode to saturation. And by changing this layer's mode to saturation, you'll be able to change the opacity on the saturation on the layer. To get the saturation on the layer, you'll go over to the bucket tool and you will put in black on the actual layer itself. And this will create the saturation of the layer. And you'll be able to see the entire layer is in black and white. Now, you can set the opacity on this so the effect is not that dramatic. So you can have some, some color, you can have less color all the way up to 100% so you can change this as you will instead of just using the saturation effect which will be one time only you can use this to great effect to choose the granular control over the black and white conversion effect now what you can also do is with this and having the mask you can go to the original layer itself use the scissors tool and you can pick out parts of the image you want to have in color itself so if you see here, I have picked out some of the glasses to be in color. And the scissors tool is one of the best tools for this as it tries to find the edges of the glasses on our background layer here. 
And of course, you could drag each point to make sure it tries to find all of the different parts of the glasses. And then we'll go ahead and click inside to select it. And if we do that and then go back to our layer mask for our saturation layer, we can go in there and we can select the brush tool, make sure it's set to black because we're going to be painting on the layer mask so we can make the color shine through. And you can just start painting in those glasses there and make those glasses show up in actual color compared to the rest of the image. And that's just a very quick way of how to do digital black and white conversion in GIMP. Welcome to the next in our tutorial series about GIMP. In this next tutorial, we'll go over a quick way how to do a coloring of a sketch that you might scan in or you have received on the internet. And it's really easy to start coloring in GIMP. To start, we'll go ahead and have our sketch open, as you can see right here. And we will go ahead and add a new layer above that sketch. So we'll go ahead and make that a transparent layer. And we will also make sure that that layer is set to multiply instead of normal. Because if it is set to normal, you'll just draw the color over the sketch beneath that layer. But with multiply, it actually adds the color over the layer, but in a way so that the previous layer on the bottom shows through. So if you see right here, we've set our color to something that's a little bit more skin toned. Make sure to do that as well. Hit OK. And then we will start coloring in over top our sketch. And you can see just by coloring in here with the color that we picked, a nice skin tone color, we can start to get the sketch to look more like something that is 3D or an actual colored in sketch. Now this is a part of the longer process here is to color in all the parts you need. So I'm going to do just a really quick once over so that way it doesn't take too long and you can see the effects, but also we're not too worried about it being too messy. So as you can see there, I've colored in her face on this sketch. What we can also do is switch a little bit to the burn tool. We'll switch to the dodge and burn tool. Then we'll switch to burn down here at the bottom on the options. So that way we can put in some shadows in the image where we think where the shadows are. And we can make sure to change your size of your brush. You can use that using the bracket keys on your keyboard. Left bracket, right bracket changes the size of your brush. And we'll brush in some shadows here on the image right where the shadows seem to be. If you have a, a sketch that has the shadows on it, it makes it easier for you to burn in some shadows. And every time you click and burn in the shadows, it will stack on top of each other. So it will make the shadows darker and darker as you continue burning. Now you, you can see that there are lines here that we can easily tell between the color and the shadows. So from there, we can do a little bit of smudging. And smudging allows us to mix the colors together so that way they are not just lines on the picture. So we'll actually turn down the rate here of the smudging so that way it's not too obvious. And we'll start doing a little bit of smudging on the image here. We can make the, the lines turn into actual colors instead of very apparent as lines. And that is a very quick and easy way to get started with coloring in GIMP. Welcome to the next in our tutorials about GIMP. In this advanced tutorial, we'll show you how to do some tone mapping on the images that you might need to get some extra color or some extra different shadows and cool things that you would like to get on your photos. Starting out, what we'll do is take a picture right here. Like I've got a picture of a good night scene. We'll go ahead and start. So we'll create a duplicate layer of the night scene. And what we need to do is create a special enhancement filter called Advanced Tone Mapping. Now, this doesn't normally come with GIMP, so I recommend that you go find a plugin for Advanced Tone Mapping. It's very easy to find on the internet. Uh, GIMP itself has a repository of plugins that you're able to find advanced tone mapping. 
And once you get that and install it into your GIMP plugin folder, you're going to go into GIMP and use Enhance Advanced Tone Mapping under the filters. Then there, that will show you a pop-up dialog window that you'll want to switch the copies of the merge layer. You want to make it about five. Press OK. It'll create a bunch of different colors and make the whole thing look really good. From there, you want to right click on the layer and click merge down and just merge down until you get one picture, one layer. Next, you'll want to go up to the colors and do levels. And on the levels, you want to switch that to maybe about 94, 93, or 92 on the gamma. Press OK there so we can get that into our picture. The next thing you want to do is create another duplicate layer. And then on that layer, you want to click Colors, Desaturate. And from there, you want to actually have it at lightness. You can do luminosity, you can do average, you can see that it changes the different shades of gray. But let's choose lightness, click OK. And then you want to go back over to colors, click invert, and you'll see all the different colors inverted here. Then you want to go to filters, blur, Gaussian blur. And you want to set that blur to about, I think I want to do 20. 20 here seems fine. So now to blur the whole image, what we're going to do with this blurred image is we are going to switch the mode on the top layer here to overlay. And now you'll see it has overlaid onto our image down below. And you want to tweak this by using the opacity bar over here on the right. So we're going to set that to about 48. And then we will merge the layers down. And now you can see we have our new image that shows the different tone maps of color that are in our night sky image. And that's how you get some tone maps in your GIMP program. Welcome to the next in our advanced tutorial series in GIMP. In this tutorial, we'll show you how to remove noise from photos where the pictures have been taken that have a lot of noise in them. And here you'll see we have started with a picture that has a bunch of noise in it, and we're going to remove the noise. And we can do this in many different ways including going to the filter option, blur, we can do a regular blur, or we can do a Gaussian blur. And a lot of people like to use these blurs to get rid of the noise in the image. However, there is a better tool to get rid of the noise in images. It is an extra GIMP plugin that you can go find. And once you download that and put it into your GIMP program, you'll see it under your enhance filter options and it's called Wavelet Denoise. And Wavelet Denoise will allow you to bring up this dialog box that produces a better algorithm to remove the noise from your images. And when you go into it, you can see a preview of the image and the noise that will get reduced. So you can move around and find where most of the noise is coming from. And then you can go down to the thresholds and you can turn up the amount of noise being removed from the image and you can decide whether or not you want to have more or less detail left in the image. And you can also change how much detail can be conserved when you start applying the denoise filter to the image. And then you hit OK. And you can see that it has reduced a lot of the noise in the image. And you can tweak this as you like. And there are many other different ways you could do this, but this is probably one of the best ways to remove noise from an image to make it look a little bit better to your clients or to any projects you might have in the future. And that is a quick way of how to remove extra kinds of film grain or noise in your images in GIMP. Welcome to the next tutorial in our advanced GIMP tutorial series. This tutorial will show you about how to use luminosity masks to help you with your photos so that way you can reduce some of the saturation in the colors of your photos or just in general, have better control over what you see inside of your photos.
to start off, we have an image open here, which we're going to use luminosity masks to remove some of the saturation in the photo so we can see more of the mountain behind. So if you go over to the left, you can see we are normally on our layers section here, and we want to create a copy of our original layer, so duplicate layer. And then we want to go over to channels, and you can see what we're going to do here is select our red channel from the rest of our channels here. Uh, we want to select all on our image. I'm going to drag the red channel down to the copy down here. And then we will start by creating this one as the L for light, because we're going to save the highlights of the image and we're going to save the shadows of the image. We'll start this by right clicking on the light part of the image and we will subtract from selection. Make sure your entire image is still selected. That will select the darker parts of the image. And we will go to select, save to channel. That'll actually save the shadows of the image. So we'll save that as D for dark. And then if you right click on our layer again our light channel here click subtract from selection one more time it gets even further darker and we'll save that as dd and then we'll go back to our lights again subtract from selection one more time and we'll save that as ddd so that way you can see all the different shadows have been saved now out of our image and we'll now go and save the lighter parts of our image instead of our darker parts. So select none, then go to our darker parts of our image, select all, and when you do this you will get the lighter parts of the image instead of the darker parts and you will do the same thing as you did before which is you will click save to channel and then I'll save this as LL, go back to the dark parts, subtract from selection, and we'll do it again. Select, save to channel, and then we'll save that as LLL. In doing this, you will have created a whole bunch of different uh, channels for your different shadows and highlights in your image. And we'll be using that as a part of our layer mask to create luminosity masks. Now if you go back over to the layers, you can click on your copy, which I'll set here as light mask, and then I'll make another copy of this, which we'll call the dark mask. And then for the light mask, we'll right click and then uh, make sure that you your selection is none. So we'll right click on the light mask, click add layer mask. Instead of normally you, you would make it white, We'll set it to channel and you can see under our channel we actually have all of our different channels here for our shadows and our highlights so if we go to our light channel we can add that and it will actually change it so you can see our light channel removes all of our shadows from the image and now we're able to edit the image of our luminosity layer by going to colors and colorize making sure that our light mask layer is chosen, not the mask itself. And with the sliders here, you can see I can change the hue of the image to make it a lot better and the lightness of the image. So that way it can come through without too much saturation going on in the image. And you can compare that to the original image, which you'll see here. Saturation removed saturation. And there's a lot more things you can do with luminosity masks in GIMP.